Good morning. Praise God. I hope everybody's doing well this morning. I'm going to read you some scriptures and then I want to share something with you. This is Psalm 30, verses 1 through 4. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought me up from my soul from show. You restored me to life from, from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Psalm 34, verses 1 th through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 107, verse 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So, for the past two days, I've been thinking that Thanksgiving is coming pretty soon. And the Lord put heavy in my heart to talk about gratitude. And uh, as I was thinking about this, I started thinking about my journey here in the United States. I came to the United States 10 years ago, and I've only lived in Iowa since I got here. And I came by myself to go to school about a year and a half after I was here. I got married, and then my wife came over, and then our situation that's going on right now started last year. So when it comes to blood family, I'm here by myself. However, 
the Lord has a way of making everything work for good. And I got the job that I have, and I started going up through the ranks until I met Lee. And she was the instrument that he used to bring me here, where I was supposed to be. And so as I'm, as I'm thinking of those days in my journey now as a born-again Christian, I said, Lord, I'm going to give my life to you. You tell me what I'm supposed to do. I've become more aware of things that I should have been grateful a long time ago, but I wasn't. Probably because I did not understand that those things were actually a blessing from him. And I took them for granted. But now... Although I'm here by myself, and I don't have my blood family with me, I have you. Amen. You are my family. Amen. And uh, I try to, to learn and, and grow as much as I can from uh, speaking with all of you. Uh, and I hope I can also do something in your lives. Uh, well, he can through me. And, uh, but the thing that I am most grateful of is the freedom that I now have because I know him. Hallelujah. And I was reading from the gospel according to John this morning on chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word... You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I think I have said here before that the legal system likes to misuse that scripture to get someone to confess to whatever crime they're being uh, accused of. But that's not what Jesus meant when he said that. And then it says, they answer him, we are offspring of Abraham and you have never been, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now that I know the Lord, uh, there's so many things that have been taken away from me in a good way. I don't care what people think about me anymore. I don't have to please anyone because to me it's more important what he thinks of me than what other people think of me. They might criticize me. They might ridicule me. If they want to be my friends, good. I'll talk about what the Lord has Lord in my, has done in my life with them. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they can also experience just an inch of the things that I have experienced ever since I have given my life to the Lord. And as I continue reading on this, uh, I found this verse in Galatians. It's from chapter 5, verse 1, and it says, For freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You know, I was afraid about many things, about losing things. But I am grateful that not only the Lord has given me the family that I have, has blessed me with some of the material possessions that I have, like, such as the house, uh, the job that I have, also in the spiritual sense, bless me with this family that I'm here. I have never been more comfortable in a place that I am in here. And I'm also grateful for the promises that he has made me. Yes. Because prior to meeting him, I had a hard time believing some of the things that it says in the Bible, mostly because of... Uh, my educational background required physical, tangible proof for things. Mm -hmm. But if the Lord says that he created the world in six days, I believe it. Yeah. 
Because if he can change insignificant things in my life, and my life becomes a hundred times better than it was before, Hallelujah. why should I doubt that he created the world in six days? Right. Amen. Amen. So that's just a little seed of, I guess, wisdom that I want to share this morning. And now I open the floor to questions. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone has any prayer requests or testimonies that would like to share? Pastor. We pray for Sally too. We'll lift her up. Yeah, Peter. I just need that. I've been praying about this for a while. I just need wisdom and direction in the process of this class. Yeah, Sheila. Thank God. 
Praise God.
You know, I read this this morning, and, and I didn't know why, but I'm not, now I know. This is also from Galatians chapter 6. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. gentleness. Keep watching yourself as you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, uh, I don't know what you're going through. I can only imagine because I have my own trial that I'm going. But when you hurt, I hurt. Amen. And and you know, any of you, whatever you're going through, uh, we cannot comprehend what it is because we're not living it. But we carry that burden as well, and that's what we do. What we do, and that's what we believe. What we believe because when we declare the truth that is being given to us by God Himself. And his word is going to happen and that's why we join and 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 we pray together and, and we continue to, to encourage each other because we know that when he says I will take care of you he will take care of us yeah. for sure so we're standing with you it's gonna happen yes God
want to say something? Debbie, did you? Okay, so you raise your hand. Suzanne. <coughs> I'm just gonna just say that. <laughs> We are free. We are free. Jesus said that what the song sets free, it's free indeed. And right now we declare that those chains have been broken. We are free.
disciples to setting them forth. They didn't send them forth unprepared. As the Lord has established your footsteps to go to Burlington, Laura needs to be restored and ready for the things that she is called to in that area also. He will not let her leave here unprepared. So she is getting healed and freed right now because of the work that is coming. Yes, you will have a work to do, but she also has a work to do, and you both have a work to do together. He will not let her go unprepared. And this morning's prayer, the unity of prayer, has busted this where now she can prepare where you are being sent. November 2nd, Thanksgiving dinner after service. I believe there is a sign up sheet in the back. So if you can come, it's going to be awesome. Huh? Yes. So I'm going to make that's a surprise. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Friday. <laughs> uh, I'll surprise you. <laughs> but, yeah, it will. <laughs> and uh, Friday, November 14th, 7 p.m., Eastern Gate House of Prayer. And we will go wherever the Lord wants to take us. And November 16th, that's Sunday, right? Okay. Gideons will be here. And that's it for announcements. not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. I, I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Thank you, Lord. The Lord reveals the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now solved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Mark and Peter, would you mind taking the offering? Peter, could you say the blessing, please?
Let's worship. Like you see up there in the uh, picture of Miriam. They worshiped their way through situations. They took it. They took the land. They took everything that was stolen from them. And took it back. They took the promises that were promised to them and walked forth and rejoicing. Not complaining, but rejoicing and loving on the Lord. So this morning, we're just going to rejoice and love on him. Thank you for what he has done. Thank you for what he is doing right now. And thank you for what he's going to be doing. Hallelujah. Y'all ready to worship? Yes. I was blinded by the devil. Born every day ruined. By his grace I've been touched and by his word I've been healed. By his hand I've been delivered. By his spirit I've been healed. I've been saved. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm saved. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm so glad. So glad. I'm so glad. Yes, I'm so glad. Secured. He brought me with a price, freed me from the pit, and full of emptiness and wrath, and the fire of the dead, I say, by the blood of the Lamb, I say, by the blood of the Lamb, yeah, I'm so glad, yes, I'm so glad. me nobody was there i was thrown down for the last time by his mercy i've been spared not my word but my faith through him who is called for so long i've been hindered for so long i've been stolen i've been saved by the blood Nobody rescued me. Nobody would dare. I was going down for the last time. By his mercy, I've been spared. Not by my words, but by his love. For so long I've been hidden. For so long I've been scarred. I'm saved by the blood.
goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to praise, 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 praise all night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to sing, 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 sing all night.
Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame. Sunday school kids can be dismissed to go downstairs. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Hey, man, let's give them a hand clap. Praise the Lord. They've done great work. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is so good. Hallelujah. Appreciate, amen, the presence of the Lord and all the testimonies. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. And I want to uh, talk to you this morning about victory. Praise the Lord. Victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And to do that, we'll start at Second uh, Peter chapter three and read verses fourteen through eighteen. Praise. 
praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, the Lord knows I'll be meandering all over the place here, but hallelujah. We'll, <laughs> we'll be focused, hallelujah, on victory. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Uh, not ours, but his. Praise the Lord. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Praise the Lord. When Paul preached grace, uh, and he preached it so extreme that they, you know, he was accused of telling people to sin, and the more you sin, the more grace there'll be, and all those things. It was difficult for, for religious people to understand what it was he was saying. I mean, that's who he's talking about here. It isn't, it isn't the, the uh, heathen, the unsaved, the unreligious that, uh, that were unlearned. The, he's not talking about religion here. He's talking about they were, they were not learned in what those scriptures were really trying to teach them what the symbolism, what the uh, analogies and so on and so forth throughout the Old Testament were about. They, didn't, they never, hadn't learned it. They were, and because of that, they wrestled with it, and uh, along with other scriptures, because we know they knew the scripture. They had all the scripture. The problem was they just couldn't make any sense out of it in terms of when Paul comes along with the true gospel that was given to him directly by Jesus, it didn't make any sense in comparison to what they had been taught based on their understanding. Right? So that's what they wrestled with unto uh, their own destruction because there is no salvation outside of Christ. Right? So ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. How are we found to be righteous or steadfast in Christ? Right? He's saying don't get led away back into the religious thing. Amen? Because that's where your destruction is if you think you're going to save yourself. There is no salvation there. In Hebrews, he writes to him and he says, if you, if you resist this or reject this sacrifice, there is therefore now no more sacrifice for you. And you are doomed. He wasn't writing to uh, uh, people who were not living perfect. He was writing to people who were not continuing in the one true sacrifice of Christ. They had gone back to... Uh, temple worship or sacrificial offerings of animals and so on and so forth and keeping the law and he said if you do that there isn't any other sacrifice for you so you can sacrifice from now till till whenever but it will be absolutely useless for you for there is but one sa sacrifice amen once and for all amen so he says then but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's look at one more scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So, victory in every area of our lives does not come by practicing the right religious methods or the correct procedures or rituals. Even if it's ones that we think are from the Bible. Praise the Lord. You'll hear over and over and over people say, well, this is what you got to do. And if you're not doing this, why, 
you can't expect to be blessed. You can't expect to be used. You can't expect to have deliverance. You can't expect any of these things because you're not doing everything that the Bible declares you're supposed to do. Well, usually that's because they have rested the scriptures not knowing them or understanding what they're about in the first place. And because of that, they lead to their destruction. They're not getting the deliverance and the victory that Christ has assured us in him. In him, not in our religious rituals, but in him. So victory is found in the person of Jesus Christ. There is no religious method that's going to give you real victory. And the longer we try to push that down people's throat, the further we push them from Jesus, the further we get them away from God. I don't, I'm not saying it isn't well intended. I say, I'm saying it's misinformed. It doesn't matter what their degree is how long they've been preaching or teaching or how many schools they've gone to or anything else, if they don't understand this core truth, then everything else they, they teach is, is, creates problems. It doesn't deliver. It, it, doesn't, it might give somebody a momentary sense of, well, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to refocus my life now on doing this good stuff. And so for a brief moment in time, they feel like, okay, well, now I'm going to get back and do this because I know this is what I've got to do. But I promise you, the best of them will fail. Yes. Yes. And then they'll be blaming themselves and God for their lack of deliverance. Right. Praise the Lord. When, when Jesus came to this earth, he did not come to give us a religion. This earth was filled with religion. We're not just talking about Judaism. Judaism was the dominant uh, religion because it brought God. It brought the truth of God, if people could understand it. But there were multitudes of religions. There was every kind of religion imaginable. You just read the Bible and you see all these different religions taking place out here. Many of them were pagan, but they were still religion. So it wasn't that when Jesus came, the last thing that we needed for him to do was to come and bring us a new religion. Right. Praise the Lord. You know, if I could just do the right thing, if I could just figure it out, then he'll be pleased. Then God will be pleased. I'm telling you, that is an exercise in futility. Uh, offering up their children to Moloch. Now, as heinous as that is, and as idiotic as we look at it and say, now what in the world do they think God was going to do for them by doing that? Well, they thought through, because of their religion it was going to bring them some kind of deliverance or, or better crops or, you know, stay the famine or bring rain or whatever it was they believed. The truth is, when you look at Judaism or religions of any kind, they're practicing the same thing. Now, I'm not saying it's that evil thing, but I'm saying they're thinking there's something they're going to do that's going to cause God to be benevolent where otherwise he would not be. Amen. Praise the Lord. So if, if religion, that's what I'm saying, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a work of futility. If, if religion offered a workable solution, Jesus wouldn't have had to come at all. Now, I know we, everybody's got questions. I've got questions. You've got, everybody has questions. The, the key, though, is to ask the right question. Amen? How many of you have been involved in situations? Well, maybe it's buying a car. It's, uh, you know, it's working a business. It's, you know, sale. It's whatever your job is. You know, people love to see people ask questions, but, the, you know, if you've ever been in a meeting like that and you're thinking, look, th these are stupid questions. Why are they even asking them? There are the right questions, the question you want to have answered. You don't just need a lot of answers or just have a bunch of questions asked. You need the right one to be asked so you can get the answer that you really need. And that's the way it is, amen, with, with victory. Praise the Lord. It's okay to have questions, but let's get to the right question and get an answer to that one. Praise God. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Praise the Lord. Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
Now that's a good question. That's a question we need answered. Amen? Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Praise the Lord. The key to victory is a who, not a what. Not what else am I going to do, not what more do I need to do, but who has done it? Praise the Lord. Who has finished it? You know, asking what or how in and of itself suggests that we believe that there must be a plan or there must be a method. Right? What, do I, what should I do? Right? What, what must I do? In fact, the guy that said, uh, what must we do to be saved? And Jesus said, just believe. On him. On me. On Jesus, right? When we start asking questions like how or what, what we're really saying is there's got to be a plan of some kind. There must be some method. God's provision is not a plan. It's a person. It's Jesus Christ. It's grace. Grace came by Jesus Christ. Grace and Christ are one. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So real, real Christianity is simply recognizing our dependence on him. It's not another plan. It's not another method. It's not another list of things that you need to do. Real Christianity is to trust him Amen. who is both in you to work and to will his good pleasure. I talked about it Wednesday night. God isn't in us for most of the reasons we think he's in us. Hallelujah. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's look at John chapter 15 and verses 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. Now, that ought to just about mess up everybody's religious thoughts about what am I going to do. Well, the only thing you can do is abide in him. Anything else you're doing is not going to accomplish anything because you, you can't do anything except you abide in him. He's the vine, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can't do anything. How, how maybe we ought to just settle that yeah. right off the bat as Christians doesn't matter that I'm a Christian. As a Christian, I can't do anything in and of myself any more than anybody else out here can do in terms of, of relating to God. It's only in Christ. So we give people the impression that, well, you know, I can, I, I, I can do all these things because I'm a, a believer, you know, and, and it gives us this kind of attitude that people look at you and go, you arrogant jerk, you know, and because I've seen your behavior. You know, I was behind you in traffic. I saw you out in the yard with the barbecue, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we come across as hypocrites when, in fact, if we were just honest about it, the only difference between us and them is we, our belief. We believe in the finished work of the cross. It's, I don't have any confidence in me. Paul said, don't have no confidence in the flesh. If there was a reason to have confidence in the flesh, he says, I'd have confidence because I did all the stuff you're supposed to do religiously. You know, I was a Jew of the Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I kept all the rules. But I learned over time that that stuff is just crap. And that's his words. He said it's just dung. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Right. Praise the Lord. So don't complicate it is what Jesus is saying. He's, Paul talks about it. I, I'm, I'm concerned that you have missed the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what, for the most part, the religion has done. We've, we've complicated everything. We've made it so complex that you have to have somebody to help you screw it up. You've got to have a preacher or somebody that's been to seminary or, or somewhere that can then help you to misunderstand everything that God came to tell us. That's not an indictment against all preachers and everybody, but I'm just saying, we don't need to complicate it. 
Look, the same way that God, the Father, expressed his life through Jesus, we are to trust in Christ and allow him to express his life through us. You say, well, yeah, it was easy for Jesus. Look, Jesus was a man. He was God in the flesh, but he never operated as God. He stripped himself of all divinity, of all authority, and came as a man, just like you and I. You say, oh, but, but Jesus was sinless. So are you once you were born again. He had a, devi a divine birth, but he was every bit human. He, had to, he says it over and over and over. I can't do anything of myself. Everything I do is what my Father is actually doing in me and through me. That is the divine. If there is any plan, that's the plan. That God would come in flesh and operate as a human being so that we could identify with that humanity. Not with God, but with the humanity. And how a divine, omnipotent God would use a simple human being without sin to do the works of God. That's why you had to be born again. So that you could have the Godhead dwell in you. Not so that you would be a perfect person on the outside, but so that the perfect person could work through you. Praise the Lord. We have had a divine birth. We got born again. That's what born again is. What got born again was not this. It was my spirit. And it's perfect. It's as perfect as it's ever going to get. This has still got some issues. Praise the Lord. And we'll continue to have for as long as it's here on this planet. It just gives me a legal right to have the Spirit of God dwell in me. I've got to have a body. That's the only way you can be on this planet. You, you, There's a sense realm here. And in order for the, for the Spirit to have residence on this earth, it has to have a physical body. Legally, it has to have a physical body to, to reside in. That's why we got a body. So let me just ask you this. Why did Jesus Christ, why did the Spirit of Christ choose to dwell in you? To be one with you? Why? Well, we, I, I'll, just, I'll give you three things that I know we misunderstand. The first one is we'd say, well, so that we can be forgiven. No, he doesn't have to be in you to forgive you. The mercy of God would be plenty to, to forgive you without him ever entering into your spirit. Well, let's say, well, then, so that we can go to heaven. No, you don't need to have his spirit in you to go to heaven. Oh, well, then what's going to rapture us? Well, there's probably the same thing that took Enoch out of here. The same thing that took Elijah out of here. They didn't have the spirit within them. But God still was able to translate them. So having Jesus dwelling in us isn't just to get us to heaven either. Because he can get us to heaven any way he wants to, however he wants to. Okay, so we've got Jesus in us so that we can learn how that we're supposed to walk with him. Now I understand the, the, the scripture said that the, the spirit of truth has come and he will lead us and guide us into all truth. But we've got all the information we need right here on how to live if it's just a question of living moral lives. And the truth is what the spirit of truth comes to reveal to us is the truth of this word that has been so screwed up by everybody, thinking that it is a bunch of religious works that we're supposed to be involved in. Praise the Lord. The one reason that Jesus came to live inside of you is so that you can experience life in the Godhead. Well, I expected about that kind of response, hallelujah, because it sounds blasphemous. But all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. He is the firstborn of many brethren. We are heirs and joint heirs with him. Whatever he got, we got. We can do greater things than he did because he went to his Father sent back the Spirit. The reason the Spirit came back is so we could experience life in the Godhead. So we'd understand that it's not me that does this stuff. It's not my healing ministry or my deliverance ministry or my anything. It's Jesus in me, the hope of glory. Yeah. 
it's God dwelling in us, help, allowing us to experience the Godhead so that God can be revealed to people who have not experienced it. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that we can experience divine life. Now, that's victory. That's victory. That's victory with a capital V that covers every single thing in life that you could ever be confronted with. Is anything too hard for God? That's why He comes into us, so that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Not so that I can become you know, just a really, really good person and then God will have uh, you know, some sort of uh, favor or hickeys with me and give me some kind of power that he wouldn't give anybody else. That's just totally bogus. If all these, these signs will follow them that believe, that means you, me, the big, biggest Christian slug uh, on the planet, which is all of us at one time or another when we really fail, can still expect that God will use them in a supernatural, mighty way simply because that's his plan. It's not based on your goodness. It's based on the finished work of Christ. It's His goodness. I'm not saying we should live like heathen and, and, and be pagans, but we're not supposed to be focusing on our behavior. We're supposed to be focusing on Him and what He has done. Because no matter how good you are, it's what Paul was talking about. None of us have lived as pure a quote-unquote moral life as Paul did. But Paul said it was still just junk. It didn't gain me any favor. Why? Because Jesus set the bar. They thought, the religious people of his day thought, we can dumb this thing down to where most of us, or some of us at least, can do it. And that way we'll have the prestige and kind of the influence and the, the pull with God that other people will have to depend on us because, after all, we're doing all the right stuff. And so Jesus just raises the bar to where God intended it to be all the time, which was that nobody can do this. You're going to have to come to the end of yourself and realize, I need a Savior. So it isn't just about sleeping with somebody else's wife or sleeping with somebody outside of uh, you know, marriage, having sex, and so forth. It's about thinking about it. Right. So I'm not even going to ask the question. It just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a done. It happens. Right. You might have self-discipline and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm faithful to my wife. I'm, not going to, I'm faithful to my husband. I know that's not right, and I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do that to them. Right? Be disciplined. But it doesn't mean the thought would never cross your mind. And that's what he says. That is as bad. That, as far as God is concerned, you're as guilty for ever having the thought as if you had done it. Now, that's, that's tough. How about murder? Well, I wouldn't kill anybody just out of anger. Or, but there's some people just really, you know, like they say, it's not the ups and downs in life, it's the little jerks that <laughs> mess you up. And there are people that you just go, God, you know, take them, Jesus, you know, take them early. But that's hatred, and that is this, that's no different than murder as far as God's concerned. Now, how many of us have never had a moment where, we've repented of it probably and everything else, but there wasn't a moment where we just thought, man, I would just take them out, just do something, because they're just... Not good. They're bad people, you know. Have we ever, ever coveted anything? Paul said, I never knew there was such a thing till I heard this, the, the, the law, the, the demand that thou shalt not covet. And he said, like, I coveted everything at that point. Immediately I realized, I want your stuff. I want your car. I want your house. I want your vacation. I want your job. I want your bank account. I want your looks. I want your whatever. Maybe we don't go steal it. Maybe we don't, you know, but we think it, it comes through our minds. In fact, the world we live in is based on covetousness. I mean, keep up with the Joneses. Look what they're buying. Look what they, this is the whole idea of capitalism. It's not a bad thing in and of itself. I mean, it's kept this country going for a long time, and we have the highest standard of living, and it's, it's good in a lot of ways. But it is about covetousness. It's about don't let anybody get ahead of you. Praise the Lord. Victory is in him. Look at Jude, <clears throat> verse 24. 
And like I said, when you go, uh, I don't think you can go far enough with this, but, but we have parameters because we have, all of us come from some kind of a religious background. If not a religious background, at least we've been influenced by religious people in our lives, even if we didn't grow up in it, right? So Jude says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude is saying what I've been saying, and I'm just, of course, stealing it from him, but it isn't up to us. Jesus guarantees that we're going to accomplish the will of God if we stay focused on God. He directs our path. We think it's he, God is playing catch up all the time. C A T. That we're, you know, we're stumbling along and then God's coming up trying to fix our stuff. Listen, whatever you're doing as a Christian, you're going through your life, and if the focus is on Him, and I don't mean to the exclusion of living your life like some monk or, you know, whatever, but just you just live your life, and through that life that you live, God will touch other people. You don't have to be a freak, you don't have to act. Oh, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. You know, let me talk to you about it. No, you just, you, you know, you got friends. You've got conversations that come up all the time. Just like what Don was talking about with their grandkids. Look, you don't have to be weird. You just be you. And, and that's what people, certain people are attracted to you. And, you know, you look at me and go, well, I don't know who those people would be. But there's somebody out there. I'm married, for crying out loud, 35 years. And so I'm just saying there are certain people that we relate to and that relate to us. As weird as we might seem to everybody else, there are some weird people like me that are attracted to my weirdness. So it makes it easy for me to talk about anything with them because they consider me to be a friend or, or somebody who they can trust or whatever. Not because I'm a preacher, because most of the time that's the last thing I tell anybody because they run from you, you know, like a pox on you, you know. Well, they know what's coming if you're a preacher. You're going to try to, you know, do something. So I let them just really cuss a lot and tell me a bunch of dirty jokes and then they'll say something like, well, what do you do? Uh, and I pastor a church. Oh my God, you know. And then it's, <laughs> then I got them, you know. Hallelujah. But you know what? I mean, I've got friends that know what I do and we're just friends, you know, period. It just, it, it's no different to them than them being a truck driver or a salesman or whatever it might be, you know. It's just what we do. But I'm saying we all have lives and personalities that connect us with certain people. God's made us this way. He's made each of us special so that we can influence the people that are close to us or that we have connections with by God and not by us. Honesty really is the best policy because you cannot hide forever. You know, it's like when you're dating, you can be Joe Cool, you can be perfect, you can be all that stuff, but eventually somebody said, you know, love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. You cannot hide it forever. At some point you gotta be you. I gotta be me, you know, praise the Lord. But she don't have to like me. Not after I've convinced her that I was somebody else, praise the Lord. But it really is true. It's true with our friends, it's true with everybody. It's best just, you know, be there. Be what you are, and they'll either accept it like Roberto said, or they'll move on down the road, you know. Praise the Lord. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what's amazing to me when I read about Paul? He, Paul never agonized over the will of God. He just did it. <laughs> You've got to have some confidence. You've got to have some faith to believe that whatever I'm doing is the will of God. It's not my job to try to rationalize and figure it out. I have the mind of Christ. If I just trust in that and just do what I do. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about going out and committing some heinous crime and thinking that that must be the will of God. We know enough, right? I mean, we know what is against the principles of God or the truth of God or the, or the nature of God. I don't need all the minute details. I just know as a rule this is the way God goes. So as long as I'm not, 
you know, in the face of, of God's nature against it, then I can trust that whatever I'm doing is God. Right? And if I deviate too far, that's what I have the Holy Spirit for. It can bump me back into the line. It's not like it's the end of the world if I make a choice, a decision that doesn't work out. Because all things will work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called to his purpose. But the point is you've got to trust in that. Because when you do make those choices and those decisions and they don't look like they're working out, you can get all freaked out and panicky and think, oh, my God, this is the punishment of God because I didn't wait and, you know, I didn't get this and I didn't do that. No. Wherever I am, God told Abraham, he said, wherever your foot touches, that's the kingdom. That's your property. That's your territory. Well, we are heirs and joint heirs of, of Abraham by faith. We've got to do the same thing Abraham did. Now, look, look at the life of this guy. He was a, he was a mess. I mean, by religious standards. He, he was told to go to this land and stay there and God will bless it. Well, he goes there, but it's not like he thought it was going to be because there's some famine. Everything's not producing like he thought it was supposed to. So what does he do? He runs right back to Egypt, which every religious teacher, I mean, I come on, I come from that holiness stuff, and that's the world. Egypt is the world. Don't be going to Egypt because there's leaks and stuff over there and garlic and Painted women. Hallelujah. TVs and movies and videos and hallelujah. Bars and beer joints and God have mercy. Don't go down there. Abraham did. In fact, he went down there and he got right in the hood and pimps his wife. She's my sister because he thought they'd kill him if he told him the truth. But what does God do? He steps in and keeps anything from happening to his wife and declares Abraham to be his prophet and says, you know, uh, Pharaoh, you need to have my guy pray for you. Oh, you mean that lying snake that gave me his wife and almost got me killed? Yeah, that'd be the one. That'd be my prophet. <laughs> have him pray for you. And he comes out of there with wealth. They were glad to get rid of him. Here, take the stuff. Load up the truck. Just go back where you came from. So he went back to where God sent him, but he didn't go back because God wooed him back or that God gave him a vision in the sky. He went back because the Pharaoh didn't want him anywhere near them. The only place safe for him to go was back to where he'd been. Now, was God directing? Sure, he was, but he wasn't... He wasn't uh, it wasn't like he went down to Egypt and God said, okay, I'm, I'm done with you. I'm moving on. I'll find somebody else. No, he said, this is the, you're the guy. You're in, and it's not going to change. I'll mess up this whole realm here of Egypt just to get you back into the perfect plan that I have for your life. And in the meantime, he gets blessed. I'm not saying there might not have been some marital issues there after that for a while, but... <laughs> Hey, man, I mean, he had some stuff. He had money. He had everything going for him when he went back, right? Praise the Lord. So, okay, you say, okay, well, I, I, what if, what if uh, the thought comes to me, and it really doesn't contradict the nature of God, is it my thought or is it God's thought? And the answer is yes. Praise the Lord. Remember, we have the mind of Christ. That's what he tells us. I'm not saying that we are Jesus or that we lose our distinct individuality or personality because we experience life in the Godhead or in Christ. What I mean is Jesus is going to express his thoughts and his actions through our individual personalities. How many of you ever heard, had a word come from the Lord, but it sounded like you? Why wouldn't it? See, when I say that, the reason for him to come and live is so that we can experience life in the Godhead doesn't mean that we become clones 
and all of us are identical and we all march around in our same colored clothes and hairdos and everything. No, we're, we're unique. We're, we're supposed to be. God uses my mind to speak his thought and then it gets interpreted by me, by my life experiences, by my education or lack thereof. All of those things play into it. And then I get to speak out to somebody and because I don't say thee and thou, or I don't quote a scripture, does not mean that it isn't the presence of God or the Spirit of God working. They hated Jesus, and the reason they hated him because he wouldn't be religious for them. In fact, everything he talked about contradicted what they had believed to be true religion. Praise the Lord. Look at, let's look at this. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 17. You know, we talk about dance. I was looking up some scriptures on dance. I'm not much of a dancer, and my wife isn't here this morning. Otherwise, she'd be happy to say amen. <laughs> I've never been comfortable with it, you know, and I grew up in the 60s, so there were some pretty weird dances, you know. The bird, all these things. I just never felt, I was just too inhibited. I just never felt comfortable doing it. You know, even when there's 100 other people doing the same thing, it just seemed weird and awkward. Two-step, slow dance, I can do that on an anniversary, you know, a wedding or something. <laughs> Beyond that, I'm just, just not comfortable there. But I was listening to a song. I told Tom Stammen the other day. I was on the way to meet him for lunch. and I just thought, there's a song playing, an old 50s, and I had this, the 50s channel on, and it was, uh, I don't know, if it was Little Eve or somebody. It was one of these singers from the 50s or 60s who said, Give me gravy on my mashed potatoes. You ever hear you know that song? Remember that? Don and I know it because we were young men when it was made. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, give me gravy on my mashed potatoes. I thought, you know, isn't that just like the Lord? Hallelujah. You know, I can't just, I can't just have mashed potatoes and butter and salt. and I got, Give me gravy. Give me gravy on my mashed potatoes. Praise the Lord. You know, whatever I got, I want more. Whatever it is, you know, I got a beautiful steak. Give me mushrooms on my steak. Hallelujah. Right? Kind of got a car. I want leather interior. Praise the Lord. Right? I got to have a V8. I'm not the juice. I got to have power. Praise the Lord. Give me gravy. Okay. I don't know where that was going, but. <laughs> Anyhow, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. Now, this is Jesus talking there. And what he's saying is Jesus danced to a melody. Jesus danced to a sound that they couldn't hear, and that irritated them. Mike and I were talking about this Friday night, the rhythms. You know how we, we talk about the vibrations. Um, picking up good vibrations, praise the Lord. But there's a vibration that comes from God that isn't the same as the vibrations of humanity. But in the spirit, you can be vibrating at the same, it's like a tuning fork, you know, and you're in tune. You know, come on, that's what we call prayer. And we're, we're, we're praying, and it really isn't so much about gimme, gimme, gimme gravy on my mashed potatoes. It's, it's really about trying to get in tune with God so that we can feel faith and confidence and you know that's what we end up you know you pray you pray and you pray and, you, and at some point we call it breakthrough but it's really just all of a sudden we're vibrating you're you feel confident you feel like God will do this God can do this now we didn't before because not because God couldn't or not because God wouldn't or not because he was saying no Be, but because we're so hung up in this other vibration of the world and all the thoughts and the, all of the fears and all the anxieties and all the stuff that's coming at us that we have to get past that and that's what Jesus is telling them. See, they're trying to get there by a certain melody to God. But God doesn't change the tune. He's got one me melody, one, one rhythm. And you've got to find that. You've got to get in tune with that. Well, we get that by Christ in us. That's the Godhead dwelling in us. We, we then become in tune with him. It's, he calls it quickening us or bringing us alive to God. There's a spiritual attuning. So Jesus danced to this melody, and 
because these religious people couldn't hear it, it, it aggravated them. His, his greatest opponents, his greatest problem was religious people. I'm saying that this being in the Godhead, this Christ in you, this is victory. It's the victory of hearing the rhythms of grace. It's a whole different thing. In the Message Bible, let me read this to you. 11, uh, Matthew 11, verses uh, 28 through 30, and this is, this is out of the Message Bible. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. And to paraphrase, the, the message would say, come to me and dance with me and you'll discover another rhythm, another melody. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. I'll show you how to really dance. The, the, the Bible's filled with God telling us to dance, to enjoy it, life and, and to experience it, to celebrate it. The prodigal son's brother, he came near the house, and the scripture says in Luke, he heard music and dancing, and it really ticked him off. Because it didn't sound like the kind of music and dancing he would have called for. He says, walk with me and work with me, and watch how I do it. That doesn't sound like Jesus saying, I only do what I see my father do. Learn the enforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound like a religious God to me. It sounds like a God that just wants relationship. Praise the Lord. Dancing to a melody that has made people that are deaf to that religious, because of that religious sound, they never hear it. Ever try to, ever try to dance with somebody who doesn't know how to dance or who has what we call rhythm, does not have rhythm? It can be painful. <laughs> Praise the Lord stomping on your feet, running you into other people. That's what the deal was with these people in Jesus. They were saying, we don't hear the same tune you're listening to. And it's irritating because you won't dance like us. Right. Yeah. Or you can't do whatever. You can't do a, a, the boogie to a, uh, to a waltz. And that it's like there are two different pages. And so that's this, this message Bible re rendering is dancing to a melody that people made deaf by religion never hear. You, how many, you know, you talk to people and it's like you're speaking a foreign language. They don't get it. And you're not being a religious nut. You're just talking about the goodness of God. And they get all offended and, and upset because they think God ought to be mad. God ought to be fixing this. God ought to be doing something to these people that are bad. And Praise the Lord. Look at Psalms chapter 37, verse 4. And we'll quickly wrap up here. And you know what that means. I need more grace, hallelujah, for that lying spirit. Psalms 37, verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That's our God. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. When Jesus came into this world, he came to a people 
religious as they were, were completely confused about the nature of God. Look at Hebrews chapter uh, 1 and verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Amen? Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. Have we got... Hebrews 1. Yeah. It's a good scripture, and I'm glad I read it twice. It's working in me now. Who being the brightness of his glory, speaking of Jesus now, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand, of the majesty on high, who being the brightness of his glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. So there, there isn't a dark side of God hidden in heaven someplace that Jesus has kept from us. Whatever you see him is, is it. It's God. There isn't some, you know, little kind of in the closet kind of stuff about God that Jesus didn't want to reveal for fear that people would freak out about it. No, he is the exact express image. Nothing hidden, nothing covered, no dark side, not some angry side of God that we don't know, but just Jesus. Amen? Think about it. The first miracle of Jesus was what? To turn water into wine. Now remember, this is the express image of God. He turns water into wine. You say, oh, it was grape juice. No, it was wine. Because they could tell the difference between the good wine and the not. I can't tell the difference between Welch's grape juice or hy V's grape juice. It's grape juice, you know. But I can tell the difference between Boone's Farm and some, you know what I'm saying? I'm not a connoisseur. But I can tell when it tastes like vinegar, that's probably not the good stuff. There's probably, you probably got something better that you're saving for people that actually know what they're drinking. So, face, let's be, believe me, it had some stuff in it. It had some kick to it. And Jesus did it. Amen? It's, it's, like, it's like saying that maybe his intention was to say, I want you all to enjoy your life. Oh, and they, they drank wine at that wedding? My God. Well, that marriage is destined for hell. <laughs> and they're getting drunk. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I know that sounds like I'm being, I, and I am being facetious, but it's just, that is how stupid we can be sometimes. Look, uh, just, just remember this. For every religious person who rejects you, there's going to be a whole bunch of other people that are going to be attracted to you. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 7 just to validate my point here that this is one God. We're not talking about a nice God and a bad God. You know, the mean God, the angry God, and then this good kind of nicer God. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepts your works. In other words, he's not judging you by your works anymore. This is an Old Testament prophecy, but they were doing it. He, he was saying, this is what you do. I mean, all you got to do is pick up a Jewish uh, calendar, a Hebrew calendar, and you'll see there is party time set aside on a regular basis. I know that they drank wine because they even keep a glass of wine for Elijah at the Passover. 
case he shows up to see her. Because he would be disappointed if it was grape juice. Because he's expecting to eat the bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart because God has accepted us. Praise the Lord. Victory is the result of casting off the religious straitjacket and living the abundant life, the God life, the Godhead life that Jesus came to give us. Acting religious does not reveal your faith. The only thing that gives evidence to authentic faith in this God that we're trying to represent is love. Praise the Lord. Life is not a test. According to Jesus, life is a rest. We've been making it all about tests. You've got to pass this, clear this hurdle, clear this next one, get, just keep raising the bar. No, it's about a rest. It's about resting in the finished work of Jesus. Amen? Amen. There is the victory. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not advocating hedonism and, uh, you know, being immoral. But I'm not going to qualify this either. I'm just not going to do it. Fear not. Praise the Lord. Jude 24 and 25, and we'll wrap up with this. I'm not telling people, we're, we're not, uh, you know, I don't have a keg in the basement here at the church. <laughs> I don't have a keg in the basement at home either. There might be a beer or two down there, but no kegs. I'm not advocating, I'm not encouraging it, I'm not trying to get you to do anything, I'm just saying, why don't we just forget this stuff? Why don't we just quit majoring on the things that were never to be majored on in the first place? Let's quit trying to make sin out of everything that we don't like personally. If it was a sin, then God was advocating sin when he told them to eat the meat with joy and drink the wine and be merry. Jesus would have been the ultimate hypocrite to have turned water into wine at a wedding if he had some big issue with having some alcohol. We understand it is moderation. Eat too much, you get a heart attack. You'll have some other thing. You'll have some other issue. It's no worse to be a glutton or no worse to be over drinking or, you know, doing more than you should than it is to eat too much. They both will create problems. The problems may be different, but they are problems. They are issues of life. Again, I'm not, I'm not telling you, go get your 12-pack as soon as church is over. I'm just, I'm, all I'm saying is, let's quit focusing on things that have nothing to do with God wants, what, what, what God wants us to focus on. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, how is he going to do that? By hiding anything that you've done that may not be right? No. He's able to present you faultless because he presents you in Christ. Perfectly perfected. Amen. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and and forever. Praise the Lord. He'll keep you from falling away. He'll bring you to a place of great joy. He'll bring you into his glorious presence. Praise the Lord. He'll bring you to himself without a single fault. Now, if we ever get to the place that we really believe this, I'd call that victory. I'd call it victory in every area, in every situation, in every circumstance, because every situation I find myself in, I'll know I can expect God's blessing. I can expect God to overcome this obstacle, this enemy, this whatever it might be. Why? Because I'm perfect? No, because he's perfect. Yes. Yes. Amen? We know David was imperfect, and there were consequences, but not from God. God blessed him. He was a man after God's heart. Amen? This is called an awareness of your own innocence before God. That's victory that overcomes anything and everything because that's Jesus. That's grace. Hallelujah. And he has made us more than conquerors. Can you give him a hand clap this morning? Praise God.
Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, hallelujah. Let's lighten up, like Jesus said. Let's start dancing to his rhythm. And quit letting religious attitudes and behaviors force us into some kabuki theater of some kind of pretending to be something you're not. And just give me gravy on my mashed potatoes, you know, hallelujah. Enjoy life. Enjoy the blessings of God. Enjoy what he's purchased and paid for us to have so that we can, God loves to see us enjoy this life. But that's, that's the way he is. Amen. Amen. Eat the bread with joy. Drink the wine and be merry. And quit letting somebody else dictate your relationship based on their misconceptions. It'll keep you in defeat when all God wants you to do is realize you are free to trust him with your innocence. Hallelujah. God bless everybody. Appreciate you being here today. Thanks for your patience. Have a great week. Get happy. Be free. Get some gravy. Enjoy it. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.